Thanks. Thanks very much. I, I think you can hear me in the back, but and, and I'm hoping that people in the next room can hear me as well. I've changed the title of my talk a bit. I'm not going to talk about climate change. You're going to hear enough about climate change, because plants are not and animals are not going to respond just to climate change. They're going to be responding to what I'm calling global changes. And so I've appropriately retitled my talk. Global change impacts on plants and animals, and it's meant to be a general talk, and it's meant for a biologist to try to understand what the environmental community, what the business community, what the insurance communities are interested in in terms of how this phenomena is going to, in fact, uh, impact their trades and businesses. I'll talk about phenology, the timing, and when you do things. I'll talk about productivity. How much biomass is produced? What's the rate of biomass turnover, and so forth? And I'll talk about sustainability. That is, what is the ability of systems or individual species to cope? How much flexibility and adjustment is there versus when you switch from one system to the next? So, in the same way that you might have abrupt climatic factors or abrupt, uh, abrupt changes in water inflows, we heard in the last talk, there may in fact be surprises associated with abrupt. Changes in the biota. Um, it takes a village, I think, is an expression. In my case, it takes a bunch of colleagues to help. And so, I want to, at the beginning, acknowledge the number of colleagues who provided uh, uh, slides and information for me. Probably uh, well known among most of these people is Hal Mooney, who's been very instrumental in the global change uh, uh, arena. Uh, Joy Ward who works on uh, elevated CO2 effects, Christian Kerner, who is one of the major leaders in understanding the consequences of uh, global and climate changes in Europe, Evan DeLucia uh, and Stan Smith and Bill Schlesinger work on elevated CO2 programs, uh, as well as Chris Field and Jack Morgan as well. So these are individuals that I've used to help uh, frame this talk. I'd like to talk local, because most environmental problems are local. Unfortunately, it's not a local problem. This is a global problem. And it doesn't do a whole lot of good in some sense to do something well locally if the guy next door, the country next door, isn't also cooperating. So this is an unusual problem that the planet's facing. And unfortunately, you don't get a whole lot of choice because it's our only home. Now, I'm going to talk about what we know with certainty. We do know some things with certainty. We know that there is atmospheric composition change. We can talk about that in terms of increasing carbon dioxide, increasing methane, decreasing ozone. Now, those are drivers for things that we know with less certainty. And the reason I'm titling my talk Global Changes is that the biota are responding to what you're going to call climate change, but they're also responding to atmospheric composition change. But because we now have a world in which we have interactions with other countries, we have a globalization phenomenon. And the result of that globalization phenomenon is we tend to transport organisms from one place to the next. And some of those organisms are better adapted in the new environment than the existing organisms. And so we have biological invasions. And those are in the forms of uh, seeds that are on the hooves of animals that are transported from Europe to Australia or to China. They are in the freighter hulls. They're zebra mussels that are attaching to the bottom. So what we have is a redistribution of the Earth's biota. We have another change, which is affecting plants and animals and affecting the planet, and that is water use changes, significant changes in things such as irrigation, diversion, impoundment. We have land use changes, deforestation, agriculture, urbanization. All of these factors, including one last one, biological extinctions, are the drivers of what I would like to call global changes. You cannot consider the consequence of a climate change without considering also how these drivers impact the biota. because there are some very direct effects. One thing I need to say with a high degree of certainty, and I don't think there'll be any objection here, is that global changes are occurring. And the status quo will not be maintained. Now, what that means is that 
the lectures I give actually have to be updated from when I started in 1978 because the vegetation has changed. Well, these global changes we can see in terms of land use changes, and I know every faculty member updates their lecture every semester, so. <laughs> but I just want to let you know, if you hadn't updated your lecture every semester, here are some important pieces of information. And this is taken from the Millennium Assessment. We have seen, since the time I arrived in Utah, unprecedented changes in the structure and function of ecosystems. Basically, following World War II, and with a lot of the changes taking place following 1970, we have had more land converted from its natural or managed state into agriculture than we did in the first 150 years, almost the first 200 years of modern uh, agricultural production. How about unprecedented change in our ecosystems? Well, we're, wherever populations are growing, we are taking what had been there pristine, whether it's, it's the forest or whether it's the chaparral of California or whether it's the tropical rainforest in Brazil, and we are converting that. So the conversions have taken large, place largely in temperate regions up until the 80s, at which time we began to invade the tropics in a very, very serious way, and the future changes uh, are in the tropics. Um, I'm not using the pointer uh, for those in the uh, uh, separate room, because I understand that the pointer won't, uh, can't be seen in the next room. Associated with those land use changes, ecosystem changes, are biogeochemical changes. We don't simply change the land surface. What we do is we add things to the land surface. And thanks to those two Germans, Haber and Bosch, we now have very cheap fertilizer. The consequence of cheap fertilizer is that we tend to produce a lot. Huh. But since fertilizer is cheap, a little bit extra fertilizer is not a bad thing, is it, commercially? Well, it is when it sits in the system. And so we've had huge changes in biogeochemical inputs into the systems. We've also had water use changes. And I just want to put up a startling graph that I saw in EOS a year ago. Uh, that'll come up in a second. We have had unprecedented changes in how we use and distribute that meager 3% of the terrestrial water. So we've quadrupled the amount of water that's in, in, reservoirs, is, in reservoirs over the last uh, 40 years. This is the, the graphic that I find very, very interesting. Here at the top, just look four pictures of the United States over the last 200 years. Thank you, Army Corps of Engineers. Thank you, local communities. Thank you, uh, state and federal entities. What we have done is to simply change the way water is moving and impounding, as it impounded. So one of the consequences is the outflow that goes into the ocean. One of the consequences is a change in evaporation. A consequence of change in evaporation, you know, even though it might be on the minor side, is a change in energy balance. So these changes are occurring. There's no doubt about it. I'm not trying to fight them. My word to students and to you is accept it. There are going to be these changes. You don't have a choice. You don't get to get off this planet. What we can try to do, though, is to come up with solutions. I think there are opportunities and there are solutions. And the plants and animals are responding to these changes. So let's look at some of them. An atmospheric CO2 change. Atmospheric CO2 affects plants directly. Now, if you look at the, uh, uh, I don't know what to call them, entertainment films, educational films, but what the oil industry was putting out in the 70s, 80s, and 90s about this wonderful world that's sitting there with high CO2 is in fact true. You will have an increase in productivity. But let's see what that really means. But before we get to that, I need to tell you that the planet that we live on has had a very different history in atmospheric CO2 over the last 600 million years. About the time that plants invaded land in the neighborhood of five to 600 million years ago, we had very high CO2 concentrations. Maybe I can move with my mouse to point out that CO2 concentrations, we're guessing, but based on our best models, are in the neighborhood of 5,000 ppm a very warm planet. Then, funny thing happened. Plants invaded land. 
they began to sequester that carbon over millions of years. CO2 was deposited into uh, the fossil fuel that we're burning today. CO2 concentrations went down. We had continents move around. We had volcanism. CO2 went up. But the history over the last 50 to 60 million years is a low CO2 environment. Now, think about that in terms of evolution. The plants and animals that are on this planet today evolved in a low CO2 world. We, as a species, evolved in a low CO2 world. Well, how low? Well, we don't know with a great degree of confidence, but we can say, thanks to the ice cores that we'll hear more about, that we are dealing in a world that was probably between about 150 and 250 ppm, a low CO2 world compared to 5,000 ppm. So I would go as far as to say that we as a species evolved in a low CO2 world. Now, these are the three graphs I love to show students. You have the history of the planet on the far left. You have the glacial interglacial in the middle. And you've got the Anthropocene, the modern world since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, with its nice squiggles that, uh, that our first speaker spoke about. So here you see we're on this race and we're up to 380 ppm. Now, this is the graph I like to use to help show the effect. Um, the problem with this graph is you have to revise it every year because the CO2 concentration keeps going up. But clearly you see that plants and animals are now experiencing a world which is really quite different. But I find that this graphic here often causes glazed looks on students. What are you talking about? So I like to put this in terms of my son. Uh, this is Josh. Uh, his parents were married when the CO2 concentration was 325 ppm. <laughs> he was born into a world that th had 330 ppm. When he started school, we were already up to 340 ppm. When he graduated, we were at 365 ppm. And the question is, what are his kids going to see? Are the kid, are his kids going to see, oh, and by the way, I'm encouraging my son and his potential future wife not to start having kids at 18, but to delay a little bit. <laughs> so by, by the time, if I take this projection, we'll be at 450, ki 450 ppm when his kids graduate. If the economy is good, we might be higher. If the economy is poor, we might be lower. But you know what? He just arrived in town yesterday looking for a job, by the way. He just graduated looking for a job. And by our inaction, we're already up to 380. We've gone 45 ppm in his lifetime. 12% of the increase has occurred in the lifetime of this 22-year-old. That's unbelievable. Now, on the other hand, it's fabulous for plants. Because for plants, they don't breathe like you and I do. And so they depend on diffusion. And so CO2 diffuses in through stomatal pores based on the concentration gradient. So the higher the CO2, the higher the rate of photosynthesis. The more the photosynthesis increase, supposedly more uh, productivity. And in fact, when you do high CO2 experiments, you grow plants under high CO2, you see a linear response between about 150 ppm, the glacial periods, and about 550 ppm, or 500 ppm, where we're going to be when uh, my son's son or daughter graduate. Then the prediction is that things plateau and level off. That's an important point to keep in mind. So the future looks good for agricultural productivity. But you know what? You got to know what crop you're building. There are two pathways of plants. One's called C3, and one's called C4. There is no C1 and C2. They happen to do with the first carbon product that's formed, a three carbon molecule or a four carbon molecule. And the C3 plants, which dominate this planet, respond well to CO2. Now, for those of you in the next room, I apologize. No, I'm going to I'll try to use the pointer here. That's what it looks like in a low CO2 world. C3 plants starve. In today's world, photosynthesis is better. In tomorrow's world, photosynthesis is even better. But there's a class of plants called C4 plants that don't even know what we're talking about. This is a group of plants that evolved 
in response to a low CO2 world. They're adapted to a low CO2 world. You think they're going to be a winner when CO2 concentration is high? Probably not. So ask yourself a simple question, well, can I see this? In fact, here, this is a graphic showing a C3 plant of butylon and a C4 plant amaranthus, two common weeds, grown. This is two weeks after they, they were uh, germinated, grown in different CO2 worlds. And you see the increase in biomass on the plants on the left. And I hope you see that there's virtually no change for the plants on the right. The C4 plants don't even know what environment they're growing in. So why should we care? Well, one reason you might want to care is you might ask yourself, well, who are the C3 plants? Who are the C4 plants? And I'm going to say, well, how about this thing called corn? How about this thing called sorghum? How about this thing called millet? How about virtually every tropical grass? They all have the C4 photosynthetic pathway. And unless you maintain them, natural selection will probably not maintain them into the future. Ah, doesn't matter, does it? Except if there are organisms that depend on C4 photosynthesis, they might be in trouble because they evolved in a low CO2 world. So that's one message. There will be shifts, C3 to C4 shifts, that will take place in <coughs> nature. Second is that right now, I, for free, representing the plant kingdom, am giving you a subsidy. And it's, there's, I'm not asking for any tax credit. I'm giving you a subsidy right now. Because land is a carbon sink. But you know what? You've not been good stewards. And so I'm not going to do it forever. I'm going to eventually saturate. So what do I mean? Let's look at the carbon cycle for a second and think of just four simple boxes. I know the next speakers will have much more sophisticated graphics. Um, but let's consider the atmosphere, man on the left, land in the middle, and the ocean on the right. And these are the numbers we've seen. They're, they're, uh, we differ slightly in the numbers, but they're ballpark the same. There's about as much in the atmosphere as there is in above ground vegetation. Probably three times as much in the soil as there is in above ground vegetation. But the big monster that you don't want to disturb is the ocean. That's where most of the carbon is sitting. What are we doing? Through fossil fuel combustion, we're adding about seven units a year. Part of those seven units rain out as photosynthesis. Plants take up carbon dioxide. And then they also respire. They give up carbon dioxide. And here's the subsidy. We're subsidizing you to reduce your global warming effects until you can get your act together. Here's my proof. Here's CO2 concentration over time. Atmospheric CO2 is increasing because of your thirst for CO2. And I'll just do the math. You tell me how much fossil fuel you burned last year, I'll tell you how much should be in the atmosphere. The, it's, I think they're red dots. I'm colorblind, so if they're not red, they're green. But they're one color or the other. <laughs> I would show this in black and white so that you see what I see, but I, I don't think people see the humor in that. But the red dots are what you expect to see. The line is what you actually see. The difference is the biological subsidy. That biological subsidy is this thing we call the biological sink. Now, scientists can argue back and forth over how much of the sink is in the ocean and how much of the sink is in the land. And maybe we even do these arguments because we want to have one more grant support. It doesn't matter. What matters is that there's a biological sink, and you're not paying a nickel for it. But you don't get to have this forever. And the reason you don't get to have this forever is because to build a plant, you need nutrients, carbon dioxide, and water. I hate to tell you this, but we're increasing CO2. I don't know that we're going to increase water that much. And I know we're not going to increase most of the nutrients. So we have an imbalance. And the consequence of that imbalance is that plants will try to get more carbon. And to try to get more carbon, they'll build more roots. And so they'll scavenge more. And the consequence of this is they tend to produce more roots and more roots and more roots, and we're cycling through carbon fast. So elevated CO2 is going to accelerate the carbon cycle, but that doesn't mean we're going to move forward with, with uh, uh, sequestration. It's a bit like being on a stationary bike. You can go as fast as you want, but you might not get down the road very far. So how do we know this? We know this because some agencies, like the Department of Energy, have been extremely
extremely insightful in asking questions about what will happen to energy and CO2. And around the United States and around the world, we have a series of facilities where we grow plants under high CO2 because we need to know the mechanism. By understanding the carbon cycle, we can predict where the sinks are going to be. That is your subsidy. So here's an example. Now, these are not cheap. They cost about a million dollars a year to operate. And the facility is a series of rings that you see, these six, six rings here. And the reason they cost a million dollars a year is because what we do is we add CO2 in those rings. And depending on which way the wind's blowing and depending on how much photosynthesis is taking place, these rings, these the vents in the rings, let out different amounts of CO2. So that inside the ring, the CO2 concentration stays constant. How constant? Plus or minus 2, 3 percent. So it's not exactly <coughs> constant. But we can create an environment that has 700 ppm day and night. So what's the first thing? Let's just do a simple measurement. Let's put a band around a tree to see how much the tree grows. When you start the experiment, the first thing you see is that tree grows a lot the first year. Less the next, less the next, less the next. It's a spike experiment. And these plants are now mining the nutrients that are available. When you begin to look at things over time, I think the last the 2005 data are now out, there's not much growth at all. There's a limited amount of growth. Well. That's the Americans. You can't trust the Americans. Let's go trust the Swiss. We all know you can trust the Swiss, so the Swiss have the same set of experiments. And they're not working with young developing plantations. They're working with 100-year-old trees. And lo and behold, when you look at these responses, uh, all trees elevated high CO2, elevated uh, pretreatment, uh, and then elevated uh, CO2 treatments, there's no difference. There's a small enhancement of growth with elevated CO2. Not much. What's that mean? Well, it means I can show you these data until the cows come home, showing you how much of an increase in, in productivity there is. But these data don't matter, because what's happening is that we're cycling through the carbon faster. How are we cycling through it? It comes out of looking at things such as what's happening below ground. And so here you see a plot of soil CO2 being released as respiration from microbes and from decomposition and plant respiration. And both plant and soil respiration, we call them fluxes, CO2 fluxes, are increased. And this is consistent with us running faster, but not moving down the road. So if you look to me as a plant, as your long-term subsidy, forget it. I'll help you for a while, but I can't help you forever. But there are some, maybe some solutions. Salt Lake City, high urban CO2 environment, maybe what we can do to take advantage of the fact that this is a high nutrient environment and maybe we can start to temporarily sequester carbon in cities. Well, we happen to measure uh, CO2 and I put this out as a public service announcement. If you go to this website, you can see the CO2 concentration at all those places that have flags every five minutes. You can download the data for free. We're trying to get this into the school system. So we've even invested in putting uh, weather stations, along with these CO2 stations, into elementary schools. Why? We want people to understand the world that they live around. And we want them to show, and we want Mark Eubank to show, not only is there a change in temperature, but this is the air you're breathing. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And you say, oh yeah, I know why it's going up and down, because you've got fossil fuel and you're driving down the road. Those are traffic in the morning and the afternoon. No, unfortunately, that's not the case. That's you turning on your heater at night. That's all natural gas coming out. So some of the peak coming up is the cars, but a lot of it is us heating our house. We can ask, okay, well, that's at night. Well, what happens if you begin to look at things well mixed? Well, I do believe Dave Chapman said that the CO2 concentration is down around 370 or 380. You won't find that anywhere in Salt Lake City because fossil fuels burning exceeds the capacity for photosynthesis and the capacity for mixing. And you only have to look at the high dots there. And you just look, you say, oh, it's January and October, November, December. You're looking at the inversions. During the inversions, you see the CO2 environment that my grandson or granddaughter is going to see when they graduate. Now, so is that going to affect you? 
Well, it's going to affect you in indirect ways because it's going to infect, affect the uh, plants and animals. How? Not by hemoglobin. It's not going to cause, we know that hemoglobin is sensitive to oxygen and CO2. It's not going to be affected by that. It's going to be affected by changes in protein content and fiber content. What happens when you grow plants under high CO2? Well, let's go to a range study. Let's take and drop a sensor on and uh, measure uh, protein changes, measure by change in nitrogen content, and we're going to find one consistent pattern. There's a change in forage quality. How do I see that as a change in forage quality? I see it as a change in nitrogen content. Look at the two right bars. One is ambient CO2, the other is high CO2. Protein content's gone down. Cows don't eat grass for the carbohydrates. They eat it for the protein. So your forage is going down. It's going down here, show it in circles, comparing uh, ambient and elevated. It's going down at the same time as the biomass is going up. So we're producing more mass, but it's got less nitrogen. If you're a farmer out here, you know exactly what I'm saying. You know, I'm giving you the second and third cuts of alfalfa. I'm not giving you the first cut. You won't see the first cut anymore. And you know what? When you get to that third cut, the effects are going to be exaggerated because of changes in, in warming. So first problem, you've got to have a solution for it. First problem is that I need to have a way of recognizing that I'm adjusting for both wildlife and for uh, grown animals to a change in forage quality in terms of nitrogen. But plants do something else. They add more fiber. So now, not only am I saying that there's less protein, but it's going to be tougher to chew. It's like you going home tonight and we don't get spinach, honey. We decided we're going to eat corn leaves. <laughs> you know, it just isn't all that tasty. But that's what plants and animals are going to be facing in the future. So I think we should start thinking about comparative studies. You can manage the cattle, but what's going to happen to the wild animals of the system? It's going to alter development and phenology as well. Well, we know about these. We know the spring is coming early. You've heard it before. You'll hear it later. That affects plants and animals. It affects them in ways that you and I like to celebrate, the cherry blossom season. It's now 14 days earlier than when the Japanese gave us the cherry blossoms. It's okay. We'll just change the date. So we can change the date of the celebration. Uh, but it's going to change other things. And, you know, we can change the duck hunting season as well. But what you see is that birds are now going to migrate uh, north earlier, and they're going to come back later. Why? Because the harsh environment they're trying to avoid is disappearing on them. There are other sorts of things. My wife's incredibly happy about global warming because she wants to get out and garden earlier. So what we should think of global warming in terms of plant responses is not that it's getting warmer, but that winters are getting less harsh. And what are the consequences of winters getting less harsh? Well, the the consequences are a change in phenology, a change in development. Oh, by the way, it does actually impact you if you're in the farming business because there's an incredible correlation. You can breed like you like crazy to improve food quality, and we have for soybeans. But if you start to look at production from year to year, you see that in warm years, uh, defined as warm nights, there's actually a loss in production. So you see this here as a graphic of a change in productivity as a function of growing season. Investors, think about this. If it's a warm summer, predicted for warm summer, sell your soybean futures. Be or no, buy soybean futures because it's going to be more expensive. Um, animals are going to move northward. That's a phenological pattern that we know is going to happen. What is the evidence? Well, we can see it. Climatologically, we can document it. And it's not even across the U.S. This is the change in growing season over the last five uh, decades, measured in the change in the number of frost-free days per decade. You know, if I was in Florida, I'd be a little concerned about the orange juice industry in California. Those harsh winters in California are disappearing. It's affecting the ranges of species. I know other speakers will speak a bit to this, but what happens if, is if you avoid the harsh conditions, animals migrate farther north. They migrate higher in elevation. That's okay, except for a few of these. The ones you better be aware of are dengue and malaria. Dengue and malaria will be on our shores again because the harsh winter conditions are disappearing. 
there are interactions between biological invasions and these climate change factors that are going to affect you sitting here in Utah. The globalization of the economies has resulted in a large number of invasive plants. Uh, tamarisk, Russian olive, you know, all of my kids in class today think that Russian olive and tamarisk are native. I mean, they were here when I was born, so they must be native. It's the only thing I see when I go along the riverbanks on my way to Lake Powell. Cheatgrass and tumbleweed, those are also invasive species. Those are the ones you need to worry about because we spent about a billion dollars a year for the last three years fighting fires. Now I'm going to tell you, you'll look back in the future when you're spending a billion dollars and say, that's cheap because you're going to be spending two or three billion before you know it. Why? Because elevated CO2 and invasive species will interact to accelerate the fire cycle. That ought to get the BLM excited. <laughs> that ought to get other people excited. And the result of this is a continuing degradation or acceleration of ecosystem conversion type. I'd love to show the pictures of what the Salt Lake Valley looked like when the pioneers arrived, after the pioneers had had a little bit of an impact, and what it looks like today. And what you see is a conversion from shrubland to annual grassland. My kids in class think this is natural. It is natural. They think it's native. Unfortunately, it's not native. Here's the victim, cheatgrass, so-called cheatgrass because it takes the water, uses the water and nutrients before other plants have a chance to get to it. This is the ecosystem conversion I'm talking about. This is, this used to be a juniper, I mean a, a, a sage woodland, juniper sage. Now, the top part, clearly you can see some leftover scars and you can see where the fire stopped burning. That is your future right here. You see the last of it. I, I like to drive to Windover occasionally. Sometimes I'll even drive to Las Vegas by way of Ely. And if you do this over time, you've seen these conversions. These are taking place because of cheatgrass invasion. And the cycle is very simple. You start off in the beginning with native grasses, and we either have a Smokey the Bear policy or we have a grazing policy, and you get more perennial grasses and invasive grasses coming in. Now we have invasive grasses. Then you've got these fires. What happens with fires is you get more invasive species coming in. And you end up with this loop of invasive to invasive to invasive to invasive to invasive. And so you've converted the ecosystem from one type to the next. Well, how do we know that things are going to accelerate? Well, down at the Nevada test site, we've got a high CO2 phase experiment. This is what the ring looks like. They put up, they elevate the CO2 concentration. They have to work on these stands so that they don't actually disrupt the vegetation in the surface but they have this wonderful ways of beginning to look at high CO2. And you know what? From, from an airplane, you can tell the high CO2 from the non-CO2 plots. This is a high CO2 plot, dominated by invasives. Left and right, high CO2, normal CO2. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that there's more vegetation in one and that the species that has responded have been the invasive species. What happens with invasive species? You increase the probability of fire because you now have a continuous vegetation cover. That is your future. You should not try to avoid it. You should plan to figure out how you're going to live within that future environment. So the drivers of climate change that I've been talking about are going to have a direct effect and an indirect effect on the growth, the productivity, and the distribution of both managed and non-managed systems of animal species. And these are the physical drivers. These are what most of the people speaking at this conference will talk about. Increased CO2, increased radio, uh, radiative forcing, less harsh winters, altered winter season length. But don't forget the economic drivers. Increased global trade, bringing in invasives. Increased human need for land. Increased human need for water. So as CO2 increases and warming occurs, there will be change, and we must find develop ways to cope with them. The carbon cycle will be faster. There might be a way to turn that to your advantage. Don't look to plants for long-term carbon sequestration. By the time you get to the CO2 concentration that my grandkids will see, we will realize plants cannot be your sink forever. Now, maybe the oceans will be the sink forever, but I think they're just as nutrient limited. The nutritional quality of feed will disappear, will, will diminish. 
Uh, growth activities will commence earlier. Plant animal distributions will move uh, forward. And the fire cycle. This is not meant to be a gloom and doom. This is meant to, to describe the changes so that you can anticipate those from a societal, from an economic and, and business standpoint so that you can plan for your future world. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer. If not, I'd be glad to escape. <laughs> yes? So the, the question, is there a mismatch between animal migration and plant metabolism or plants greening up? And the answer is no. The, there is evidence to believe that these two things are not super coordinated, but they are relatively well linked. Plants green up in response to a change in, in temperature. Animals move north in response to the temperature. And if the vegetation isn't there, they simply don't migrate farther north. And so I don't think that there's going to be a mismatch at all. In the front, question. Um, in, in California, we have lots of old oak trees, but not very many baby oak trees or adolescent oak trees because of all the grazing and ag practices. So how are those oaks going to like stand up and move north if they don't have um, well, oaks? Well, good question. Who gets to move and who doesn't get to move? Lesson number one, invasives get to move, and they get to move fast. Long-lived organisms don't get to move very fast the rate of change will exceed their rate of migration capacity. So uh, I would not be looking to see lots of new young oaks sprouting up and moving north because your, your land use practices are going to prevent that and their capacity to get developed is going to be slower. So a lot of the migrations are going to be in the herbaceous things, the things that have a, a short life cycle and a high establishment rate. And unfortunately things like redwoods, uh, valley oaks, they have a low establishment rate. Now, we can help, but it would take intense human management. I don't think that's going to happen. Yes? No. I, I, no, the question is, is the Kyoto Protocol a waste of time? Absolutely not. The Kyoto Protocol is a wake-up call. In 1997, every year, I ask my plant ecology students, I ask my ecology students, how many of you have heard of the Kyoto Protocol? No one heard of it in 1997. No one had heard of it in 1998. No one had heard of it in 1990. Maybe one or two. Every student hears about it today. They know about it today. I think the Kyoto Protocol might have failed in some ways, and it is a sh people should realize it was a short-term, it is a short-term protocol, but it is opening our eyes to the solution. I think by the time 2012 comes along and we start thinking about things in a very serious way, we will realize that afforestation is a very short-term solution. It is a solution, but it's not your savior. It's not going to allow you to continue to expend CO2 at high rates. It gives you a short-term solution. And the plants in the wild are also giving you a short-term solution. They're your subsidy. The question is, are you going to take advantage of that? I think, uh, just, to, just to reiterate the point, the Kyoto Protocol has been a wake-up call for a younger generation. Maybe not for my generation, maybe the generation older than me, but it's been a wake-up call for the young generation. And I think when they get into power, we will see much more movement. I hope. <laughs>